Thank you, Peter. Welcome all to the August meeting of the ACSA Queensland. We have our local members, of course, and ACSA members from Victoria and New South Wales, and also tonight, a group of Australian Air League cadets from Arnold Dutch Sons Air League squadron. <clears throat> we don't yet know, of course, when it will be suitable to resume our meetings at a regular venue in the departure lounge of the Terminal Building Budget Field Airport. In the meantime, we can keep you engaged and entertained with these Zoom meetings. HSA's David Knight and David Prosser have advised me that the Aviation Heritage magazine, volume 51, number three, is at the printer and nearly done. It had been held up a little by needing to avoid the coronavirus, but it should be in your letterboxes in a couple of weeks. If you're not a subscriber to Aviation Heritage, get in touch with HSA and take up a subscription. If you start partway through the year, you will receive the other editions of the year. Next month, 25th of September, we'll have David Lindley presenting Searching for SAR, SAR being San Antonio Rose of B-17, which went missing on a raid to Rabaul in the beginning of January 1943. For October, local member Daryl Purden will present Sydney Cotton Part 2 about the importance of aerial photography. To finish the year, in November, Michael Malkirrington, excuse me if I mispronounced that, pronounced that We'll present Anzac and Aviator about Ross, Sir Ross Smith, a highly decorated pilot in the Australian Flying Corps, who in 1919 was captain of the Nicodemi that made the first flight from the UK to Australia. He was later a test pilot for Vickers Smith in England. For tonight, I'll hand you back to Peter Dunn to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, David. Thanks, Warwick. Um, before I, we do that, um, Robert Van Wokum, did you want to talk about your next meeting in Victoria? Uh, yes, Peter, please. Um, on Wednesday evening, the 16th of September at a quarter past seven, we will have one of our members, Derek Buckmaster, as the guest speaker. Uh, Derek will take us back to 1936, and it's all about a newspaper war between the pro-Empire and the pro-Australia factions and this relates to the decision to uh, select an American-designed aircraft and engine for production in Australia. In summary, it's all about the wear away. Righto, thanks very much. Now, I don't think Tom Lockley's back with us. He had to duck away for a short while, but he's uh, got a talk on next week and he's got a very excellent presenter um, who's going to talk about uh, Swamp Ghost and Friends, which is the um, first 12 B-17s that went, later went on to form the 435th Bomb Squadron, the Kangaroo Squadron, which arrived uh, in Townsville through um, Archfield and Amberley, by the way, um, in February 42, and made the first bombing raid uh, from Queensland uh, um, on Rabaul. And they arrived. So that's on next Wednesday night. So I'll just stop that share now. And um, I'll just introduce um, Owen Zupp, who's uh, an airline pilot. Uh, he does a lot of guest speaking and he's uh, going to talk tonight about his father, Philip Zupp, and the title is A Life in the Sky. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to Owen. Uh, if you would like to start that share, um, Owen. I will do. While he's doing that, if people um, click on speaker view at the top, you'll get a better experience. You'll just see the presentation and you'll just see Owen, not everyone else. Speaker view, top right. <clears throat> um, Owen, you've, you need to get out of that. <laughs> you, didn't, oh. you didn't do what we practiced last night. You need to um, stop the share because we're yep. seeing your file explorer. Okay. Right, uh, you need to now open PowerPoint. Yep. And then share that PowerPoint screen. Okay. <clears throat> Second. You're seeing that? Not yet. Okay, I'll try it again. I've done four of these this week and it only ever seems to play up here. A second. <laughs> Worked well last night. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you need to have the PowerPoint open and then yep. click, on, click on the share screen at the bottom. Yeah, it was open, just then I. And then select that screen. <clears throat> okay, there we go. PowerPoint's open now. Okay, close that. You're not giving me confidence, Owen, in your captain pilot pushing function. Mate, I don't have to think this deeply normally. <laughs> right, okay, so you're seeing it now? Yeah, mate, it's all good. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, yes, as uh, Peter introduced, the story is fundamentally about my father, which writing it was one of the, the challenges was to, to get the facts across without getting too close to the subject. And... Um, Ultimately, it was a, a journey of discovery for me as much as it was uh, recording the historical facts. There are a lot of anecdotes in, in the book, uh, but I've only related stories that I could find documentary evidence amongst uh, the military uh, records. So the, there are actually quite some interesting stories that didn't make it, but I'm thinking about doing an annex. Um, he doesn't look much like a commando or a fighter pilot there. That was taken in the mid 1920s and it was a photo he hated because he reckons he had a lazy eye in it. Um, but he was one of what they went on to call the golden generation, fundamentally those that grew up through the Great Depression. And uh, in the Darling Downs, it was also coupled with the drought. And so they were very tough times growing up as I'm, I'm sure we're all aware. But in retrospect, I think that was probably a very sound preparation for the, the life that he was to have, even though he wasn't aware of it at this very early stage. A rough start. As I said, there was Great Depression and the drought. And uh, by the age of 10, he was actually helping his father drive cattle on the long paddock up along the side of the road, because uh, the farm was that barren. And ultimately, they ended up losing the farm. They're a third generation Prussian family. One of the jokes was uh, that during World War I, they were probably throwing hand grenades at each other. Uh, his father's name was Wilhelm, and his uncles were Karl with a K and Friedrich. And they all changed their names to Bill, Fred, and Carl with a C during World War I for obvious reasons. Um, the loss of the farm also led to the loss of his schooling at about 13 years of age as he sought a job actually working in the local foundry where they built uh, Southern Cross windmills. And because he was rather diminutive, uh, he used to climb inside the furnaces to clean the, the carbon off the walls of it, somewhat like you'd, you'd imagine in Oliver Twist. He was also subject to quite a degree of, we'd probably call it bullying in these days because he was a, a fairly slight lad. But he'd always had a dream that he, he was going to fly. He wanted to be a pilot, but he once said to me, he might as well have dreamt of going to the moon back then because the family was broke, the farm was gone, but there was only one thing that gave him any sense of hope and that was the Air Training Corps. And as, as you are probably all well aware, that was very closely uh, tied to the Air Force, even with almost a sense of obligation on completion, that uh, you were to move into the RAAF. Furthermore, the training at each subject came with a certificate which the Air Force recognised. And this ended up being very beneficial for him having left school at around 13 or 14 years of age, because when he subsequently went to Air Force recruitment, they recognised these certificates. They looked at the fact he'd left school very early with a bit of uh, suspicion, but the Air Training Corps certificates allowed him to go through the interview process. He dreamed of being a pilot, but he was selected initially as a navigator, and he was, he was absolutely thrilled because all he wanted to do was fly. Uh, initial training was out at Kingaroy, and he met some trainees there that he'd, he'd crossed paths with a number of times in his life. And after that initial training, he went down to Mount Gambier. And his vivid memory of Mount Gambier is just being wet, cold and miserable. And training on the Anson down there at uh, uh, Mount Gambier, he struck something that he, he'd never anticipated. And that was that he was violently airsick every time he went up. So he, he dreamt of being a pilot. All he ever wanted to do was fly. And he was horrendously ill every time he went up. And he was probably quite close to getting scrubbed off course. 
One of the interesting uh, stories he did relate was that the weather being so bad at Mount Gambier, if they ever went out and uh, had trouble getting back in, they used to trail the HF trailing aerial out and let down. And when it touched the water, they'd get a, a flicker on the signal. And that's when they knew they were about as low as they could go. So that was a very early form of radio altimeter, one would suspect. But ultimately, he overcame the uh, air sickness and he was approaching graduation as a navigator and D-Day had just occurred. And they all got marshalled into a hall one day and were told, you're now surplus to requirements. D-Day has gone better than we need. We've got air crews sleeping in railway carriages in Britain. You're not needed as a navigator. And I interviewed a chap whose surname was Young and he said, I was about the only person who spoke to your father because when we queued alphabetically, I was always standing beside him. And they offered us a, a discharge, a ground position or a transfer of service. And this chap took a, a ground posting with the Air Force and my father put his hand up to transfer to the Army, which with this chap said he almost reeled over in horror because he transferred out of the Army to come to the Air Force. Uh, and he couldn't believe that dad had actually put his hand up to go across to the Army at that stage. So very close to um, graduating from Navigator's course, he uh, went over to Bathurst for his initial training with the Army. From there, he crossed paths once again with a number of other RAF trainees from Kingaroy who'd, who'd taken the same option. And then they went from there to Cowra. The story goes that when they arrived at Cowra, as they're prone to do in, in various military <laughs> establishments, they had to queue for everything. By the time they'd queued for kit and queued for this and queued for that, he'd got his Hessian bag for his uh, mattress, his palliasse, and then he had to queue again to get the hay. And he said, I'm over this. And he walked back to the barracks, threw it on the ground and just slept on the empty Hessian bag. And uh, the chap who actually ended up being my sister's godfather said he, at that point, there were two senior NCOs saw this, this rough nut sleeping on his Hessian bag. And he was then approached to become a, a commando or he was asked to volunteer for commando training, uh, which he then took up that option. He trained at Canungra, a lot of live firing exercises where they had to crawl along with uh, Vickers shooting over their backs, um, running through paddocks where there were preset charges going off. But for him, the, um, the scariest one was because he couldn't swim, they had to jump off about a 30 foot platform in full kit into a, a mass of water. And he still said he could still remember the bubbles just going up and, and praying that he got to the surface again. He said it was the ugliest dog paddle to get to the other side. But that was his, his most vivid memory. The other one was that all through training, they'd told, been told as commandos, they had to have initiative and, and look for the easy way. He said on graduation, the trucks turned up to take them all down to the docks uh, to ship out. And the infantry all climbed in there. And the commando boss said, no, you're all marching down to the, the docks. You're commandos. And he stood there shaking his head on a 40 degree day. Why, when there's a perfectly serviceable truck, do they have to march down to the docks? So he said, after all this preaching about using initiative, he said it was just stupidity. He um, subsequently ended up shipping to New Guinea towards the end of World War II. He got up there in mid-1945. And he landed at Weewak and uh, was stationed at a place called Karawop on a little peninsula. Uh, he had a very lucky escape, as I'm told, in that uh, he was transferred troops into C Troop and B Troop went on patrol as soon as they got up there. They were ambushed and uh, two of his very good friends were both killed on that patrol. It was one of the last fatal patrols of the war, actually. And um, he subsequently went in the next day with their group to secure the village. The Japanese had left by that stage, but uh, he was on the sortie basically to go in and, and bury them. And he was 19 at the time. And I often sort of look back and think his, his first uh, baptism as such was to go and bury two chaps that he'd just been through training with. And I think it, certain things he said later in life, I think uh, made him a little bit bitter about it. He said it was just a mopping up operation in, in his opinion they could have sat on the beach and waited. Um, in terms of the Americans dropping the atomic bomb, he said, we're the worst informed troops in the world. He said, someone said something about the Yanks dropping a big one, that was it. Uh, but when the order came through that the surrender had taken place, they were also told 
to not down tools as such. And a number of firefights uh, did occur after the surrender because uh, either the enemy weren't prepared to lay down their weapons or they hadn't been told. So in that time, there was a lot of sitting around once the surrender had happened. And he used to go up to uh, Taji Airstrip where 100 Squadron were stationed with Beauforts because he was still very passionate about um, being a pilot. He, he, it was one of his dreams post-war if that could ever happen. In fact, he carried an, an Air Force pilot's flying manual that he, he uh, requisitioned when he was on Navigator course. And he carried that in his kit bag right through his time in New Guinea. And then subsequently when he went to Japan. At war's end, uh, the return vessels back to Australia went in reverse seniority. So the longer you'd been away from Australia, the sooner your ship went back to Australia. As he was relatively new overseas, uh, and most of the 6th Division chaps had uh, come back from the Middle East, then done a tour of New Guinea, he was low on the priority list. So he's offered to either go to Borneo or um, Japan with the occupation force. So he opted to go up to Japan. He uh, described sailing in that day. Uh, he was amongst the first boats that arrived actually in February 1946, that it was very eerie because the superstructures of the, the sunken Japanese vessels were sticking up and he said there wasn't a breath of wind and everyone sort of sailed amongst these um, superstructures. He said over on the, the side, you could also see the carving out of the the rock faces where they were submarine bases. So he said it was very interesting in, in one way. And then when they landed, he, he was confronted obviously with the devastation of Hiroshima because that's where he was initially posted. Uh, one thing he, he did always comment on was though that the harshness of the scene that, that the local residents were just fossicking through the rubble, just trying to find firewood. It was, it was that tough. Um, he, another, instance he, he had was on one of the trains because I often said to him was it you know there was some fear element of, of landing in in the the enemy's backyard and he said no he said they were very um much accepting of the situation in in most cases in fact he was on a, one of the rare trains that was running up to Tokyo one day where he did do a short posting and there was a Japanese woman couldn't get the window open so he went over to help her and he unsheathed his bayonet to jemmy the window open and the entire carriage ran away from him. So he said there was never any real fear up there, even though he said we did armed patrols. It was well and truly um, over by that stage. What we've got there is a, 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 di a artwork done by one of the street vendors of him up there. Here's uh, the hearing protection he was issued, his two hands firing um, artillery. Uh, up in Japan and the down the bottom this bridge is the T bridge that the Enola Gay actually used as its aim point for the uh, A-bomb. So he was up there until uh, mid-1947 and he came back and what I call it is it's the restless year. He couldn't settle down and when people described him when I was interviewing them they called him a drifter. I couldn't believe it because I grew up with a very disciplined individual who kept the fuel consumption of his car to about 10 decimal points. So to imagine it, my father as a drifter was, was somewhat hard to imagine. My uncle said he'd turn up one day on his motorbike, uh, stay there for three days and without warning, he'd just be gone again. No one knew where he was. And what he was doing was he was working in the cane fields of Queensland and trying to get enough money together to learn to fly. Uh, the pay was very good. Uh, the conditions weren't the best. Uh, but he managed to put a lot of money away and uh, was getting into a position where he could learn to fly when he actually got into a fight in the cane sheds, which expedited the process. And he um, went up the road at Townsville and re-enlisted. And on the form, it says, uh, have you ever been charged or convicted with an offence? And he said he felt like writing not yet after he'd just got into the fight in the cane sheds. Um, but... He couldn't wait to get back in, in uniform, basically. He said it was, he said to me, it was the most meaningless year of his life, basically. He, he loved the, the rigid structure of the military after the childhood he'd had where it was somewhat random. So this photo here on the left is taken at Townsville on the day he re-enlisted. And he re-enlisted as a, air me, uh, a mechanic and was sent to Wagga to train. 
So when he was down at Wagga, he would do his courses and, and training in airframes and engines, uh, but he was learning to fly at Eric Condon's flying school of an afternoon and a weekend. And um, he kept applying for pilot's course. And I think it was four times in total that he applied. And every time he was knocked back for pilot's course by the RAF because of his education. He was then transferred up to Rath Mines to work on Catalinas, the flying boat base up there. And unbeknown to him, he walked up and he saw a, a standing order or whatever it was on um, the notice board. And they were calling for people to remuster as pilots, trying to revamp the numbers of the Air Force having dwindled after the close of World War II, because this is uh, 1949 at, by this stage. And uh, the commanding officer walked up behind him and said, why don't you apply? I've heard you've got a pilot's license. And he said, sir, I've tried four times. They just keep knocking me back because I left school when I was 13. And the CO said, just try one more time. And I've actually found the, the letter that the, the CO countersigned and wrote an accompanying letter. And within about a week or so, he was on his way to Point Cook to start a pilot's course or to get screened for it. So he um, went through the screening process, whether to become a NAV or a pilot, and he actually sort of cheated a bit. He ducked over to Essendon without telling anyone and did a few flights in the Tiger Moth before his screening test, and he got into air crew, uh, which I, I still think he rated as the greatest thrill in his life. And what we've got here is um, obviously him at Townsville on re-entry, and then you've got a formation over Melbourne. I think it was Australia Day that they did out at Point Cook, and that's his graduation with... Uh, Forget his rank time, I think it's Air Marshal Jones uh, was his graduation at the Point Cook uh, Parade Ground. Vic Oborn, who's one of his squadron mates, told me at my father's uh, memorial service that the night he graduated, he sewed a pair of wings onto his pyjamas and slept in his uh, pyjamas with wings on them. He, he couldn't believe that he'd actually got through. And when I researched his records, only once was he ever rated anything other than average. He got average plus for air to ground attack, which coming up to Korea was probably advantageous. But he always said, oh, I was average. I just had to work at it. And I think that was a, a very good lesson for me growing up. Fighter pilot. He wanted to be a fighter pilot, but his first day was actually spent at a Lincoln squadron at Amberley. There was a mix up and he ended up at Amberley on Lincoln's. And he said, oh, I had to fly with this old bloke. He was a, a, he'd got the DFC in World War II flying Lancasters. This old guy. And when I did the research, he was about four years older than Dad. He was only about 24 or 25 or something. And, but he'd obviously been through a fair bit. And he had one day on the Lincolns, and they did, I think, eight and a half hours flying up through Charleville, Longreach and that. And he said the chap would take it off, get it level, hand over and he'd go down into the nose and go to sleep. And dad said he had the, the manual for the Lincoln on his lap because he'd only ever flown the Oxford was his only other multi-engine aeroplane. Uh, and it had the fixed wooden props and he was looking at sinking props. And he said, I spent the whole time sinking props. And then I'd yell, we're coming up to Charleville. Blake had climbed up, put his climb back up, land it, take it off again, top of climb. He'd go, you got it. And climb back down. He said he slept about six hours six hours and he said i just sat up there petrified with this this book on my lap when he landed there was someone waiting there already telling him he was supposed to be in canberra with three squadron to convert onto the mustang so he hadn't even really unpacked uh then he was sent to canberra and that top shot for those of you familiar with fairburn i know fredo is um that's looking across at fairburn base uh at um canberra and it'd be very close to the intersection of runway 35 and 30 now, I guess. So he went to um, Canberra to train with three squadron. And they trained them on the Mustang by putting them in the back seat of the Wirraway and take off and landing flapless from the back seat. So they got used to higher speeds on approach and having very poor forward visibility. And then once they were semi-competent at doing that, they just popped them in the Mustang and Obviously, your first flight was a solo flight with the single seater. They were very big on low flying because up in Korea already it had started and they were having 
issues with low flying and people getting into um, dead valleys and that. I spoke to Jim Fleming about this. And Jim was actually one of the instructors at the three squadron when he was there. And they used to go to the hills south of Canberra a lot and do low flying. They also used to play Make Your Shadow Disappear over Lake George. So they just get lower and lower and lower and lower and lower over Lake George till they were kicking up water. And uh, he and Ken Town are actually caught by the boss flying over the top in an Oster one day, but it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek reprimand because that was very much what they were training them at the time. From there, it was up to Williamtown onto the single-seat vampire and no ejection seat at that stage. And as you can see, nose wheel pressurised and jet, they were first three and they were all solo. And he hopped in, he was showing how to start the engine. He knew the book inside out and knew where everything was. But he said when he first took off in the Vampire, having flown the Mustang and Wirraway, there was no nose to set an attitude. And he said he took off and he couldn't set an attitude. He said, I felt like I was at the front of a Volkswagen Combi. I had nothing to set attitude by. And he suddenly realized you had to actually sometimes look at the instruments. Because everything he'd done up to that point, he said, was looking outside. Formation, gunnery, aerobatics, everything was visual. And all of a sudden, he had to start to tie in the instrument panel. And um, he did that, flew the vampire, packing the droves, etc., off Williamtown. And then his time came, and it was time to head up to Korea. The, they flew up to Korea, and at Iwakuni in Japan did their conversion. And at that stage, the conversion was very minimal. They had the two-seat Meteor, and he did two hours in the two-seater. And then he was given the single-seater for two hours to go out and just shoot up an island and practice firing guns and that live. So with four hours on type, he was then given a Meteor to fly across to Kimpo and join the squadron. Uh, he subsequently met up with two of his course mates, or th two of his course mates and one of their friends, uh, and was put in their tent. It was Vance Drummond, who I'm sure some of you have heard that name before today, and Bruce Thompson, and I think the third chap was Don Armit. And basically on the day he got there, or the next day, they went out on a patrol and he was to do some GF general flying, and all three of them were shot down. And uh, Drummond and Thompson ended up being prisoners of wars, prisoners of war, and they were uh, repatriated at the end of the war, but Armit um, was killed in action. That evening, Dad was sitting there waiting for them to come back and he heard a shuffle and in came Gordon Steege, who was the commanding officer at that time. And he said Steege didn't even look at him other than to raise his hand when Dad went to stand. And he said he just looked at the floor and said, look, they've all been shot down, we'll get you another tent. He said, this one's no good. He said he got up and walked out. <laughs> he said that was about the only time <laughs> He sort of had much interaction with Steege other than when he first had to address him on arriving at the base. Um, his impression was that, that Gordon Steege was very battered by that stage. He was worried about the under-trained pilots that he was being given at that stage and pulled them back to a combat air patrol role after they lost those guys, including Drummond and Thompson. And not long after that, Gordon Steege was returned to Australia and replaced by Ron Susans as the CO. And Susan's was the CO that moved them into the ground attack role. Uh, it was pretty much on the job learning Dad always related. He said, if you survive six weeks, your chances of survival, he believed, went up exponentially because you just weren't trained in a number of these things. Uh, on one of his first sorties, they did a gun test and he'd only ever flown live fire formation with a Mustang. So without thinking, he pulled up into tight formation echelon and they did a gun test and he thought, what are those sparrows flying past? And they were shells being ejected from the boss because the Mustang used to eject the shells over the wing, but the meteor shut them down. And he said, it would have been very undramatic at a slug through the front. No one knows what happened to you. And he said, they were simple things that you just hadn't had enough experience. The other one that was very treacherous for the meteor was all the training had done on the Mustang, which was a lot lighter aircraft, and they lost a number of the aeroplanes with the heavier inertia not pulling out. And um, they just bottomed out into the terrain at the, the bottom of a gun run or a rocket run uh, because of that higher inertia. 
as he said, we the first time you did it, you were doing it in anger and no one had really warned you of it until later on. Uh, what we can see here, obviously, that's him with Bill Middlemas, typically outside the accommodation. Um, that's that's anti severe anti-icing there in the middle shot. And in fact, they used to taxi out very close behind the other chap uh, to let the E-flux melt ice off the leading edges once they'd uh, scraped it off. And he used to often fly number two to the CO. So the CO had no one to do that. So he said often they'd take off and the CO would just drop away. Then suddenly he slowly would come back up into formation as he got a bit more lift off his wings. Um, that top right there is 134. Don't know if you can see it. It's behind my little panel, but there's a hole in the tail there. And that's uh, where he said they didn't quite get a bead on him that day. And down the bottom, we're looking at Dad with his ventral tank. And that was probably the major vulnerability of the meteor in a ground attack role, was that they burnt the fuel out of that so it was full of vapour. And a number of their losses were the result of the uh, ventral tank catching fire or exploding. Uh, it was susceptible even to small arms fire at, um, at low level. And the ejection seat, he said, we were operating down at the bottom of a rocket run a few hundred feet. He said at a gun run, you might be 30 or 50 feet. The ejection seat was never going to, to get you out of it at those altitudes. And the squadron lost around 40 pilots. It was around one in four at some stages uh, that they were losing guys in the ground attack role. He had a number of close calls, but the one that sort of came to pass later on in his life, 6th of February, 1952, uh, there was Wall Rivers and a Flight Lieutenant Butch Hannon um, were making an attack and Hannon's ventral tank was hit. He caught fire and ejected. And then Dad, who was on top cover with uh, Squadron Leader Taylor, was called in to try and locate the chute. Taylor formed up with the other meteor and, and held cover over the top. And my father made two passes through the, uh, the anti-aircraft fire. And Rivers, who ended up flying over 300 sorties over two tours, said the anti-aircraft that day was the thickest he ever saw it on two tours. And he wondered why they were even there. And he, he was sure that dad was going to get nailed as well. And after two passes, he hadn't seen anything. He went to try and lead other meteors in, but he couldn't find them and they couldn't find him. So he came back, made a third pass, thought he saw a scarf on the snow. And as he turned around, he always thought he gave them a profile to look at and they got hits on him directly. And as we can see in the bottom shot here, uh, it blew his canopy off. And in the top shot here, we've got, I've still got his goggles and they've got blood on the back of them. But you can see where one of the projectiles or a ricochet hit him across the goggles there. And um, knocked his mask off, goggles askew. Uh, he was about 30 feet wet above the ground when he got hit. And he said he doesn't know how he didn't put a wingtip in. He pulled back straight away and he started to grey out. And he said when he saw white ahead of him, he hoped it was cloud and not snow. Because that was about the last thing he remembers. He said the noise was horrendous. Uh, but he managed to get the meteor back. And um, went into the American hospital. Got stitched up. Although he still had metal and perspex in his face till the day he died and um, went out and the next morning flew two more missions, uh, signed himself out of the hospital. The Americans were very impressed and that citation there was to award him the, the Purple Heart. And it was the first, at that stage, officially awarded Purple Heart. He didn't know that and unbeknownst to him, there was communications going between the Australian Prime Minister, Governor General, and the um, head of the, Commander of the United Nations Forces and the officers in London and they blocked him wearing it. So it was awarded with citation, but he was not allowed to wear it. So he came back unaware that all this fuss had been made at political level. And he met my mother on the night he left for Korea. And when he got back, she always said in less than a hundred hours of face to face, they got it engaged and married. And um, he had a civic reception up at uh, Brisbane when he got back and he always had a chuckle because some politician was speaking to him and he could hear his, his somewhat less educated father standing behind him and someone said you must be very proud of your son and he said yes he's got the United Masons medal he'd never heard of the United Nations <laughs> so it, it was a bit of a contrast of their two worlds 
Uh, additionally, a, a contrast was shown when he got back from one of the missions. He hopped out and Susan said, can you drive me over to the ops hut? And dad couldn't drive. And he said, you're kidding. You're climbing out of a meteor and you can't drive. He goes, no, I've never been in a car. And so Susan's hopped him in the driver's seat and they crunched the gears all the way over to the ops hut. Um, so yeah, he was flying meteors in combat, but couldn't drive a car. Um, back here in civilian life, uh, they had their honeymoon at East Sail, which having been to East Sail is not where you'd imagine having a honeymoon. Um, and then he went to instruct and flight screen up at Archfield. Then he returned to flying fighters at Willytown and unable to get married quarters, commuting from Sydney and that ultimately he left the Air Force and, and mum always felt it was something he really missed um, having left the Air Force in 1956. It's mum, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned she was a WAF as well. I'm working on a book for her. Uh, in civilian life, he um, initially went to the Royal Aero Club of New South Wales as a flight instructor, where he got chipped because he uh, thought a student was solo one day and um, the student said, I'd like to do a couple more circuits. And he said, it's not your job, I'm the instructor. You're going solo. And he had to be explained that in a corporate environment, they were customers, not not boggies and they don't have to do go solo when you say so. So he had to sort of adapt to civil life in a number of ways. He then went to Qantas and he flew the Super Constellation for nearly five years, but the trips away were fairly uh, horrendous. They were at times six weeks I see in the logbook and mum had hoped he left the Air Force to be home more. And the other thing, and it, it played a role in his life in the Air Force as well, he was a non-drinker. and for instance, in Korea, the average missions on a tour was 130 and he did over 200. And interviewing the other blokes, I said, look, he just never came in and had a drink. He just went flying again. And Qantas had a fairly um, social culture in those days. And I don't think he sort of fitted in. He, was, he tended to go uh, sightseeing more than any. So he stayed five years at Qantas, got offered a job at Airlines New South Wales, flying regionally, and he loved that. And then he got retrenched from there. So he, he moved out to Bankstown, was towing targets in the Mustangs and training the Qantas cadets from their cadet scheme. His civilian career took in charter. He was CSIRO for the rainmaking, which he rated as the hairiest flying outside of Korea, where some scientists would go, we'll go into that cloud. And they'd pick the blackest cloud they could find. And he'd come out and he said the aeroplane had looked like it'd been smashed up with a ball pane hammer. And that's uh, one of the Cessnas that he did it in down the bottom right there. And it's actually got little ducts in there, additional ducts on the engines. So there's the Connie, the DC-33 in New South and rain making. But the best job he said he had ever had without getting shot at was flying the air ambulance. And um, Tom Lockley will recognise that. That's out of the Powerhouse Museum, the HAMB. And Dad actually did the final flight of AMB from Tamworth to Sydney before it went in the museum because they um, had stripped it down to bare bones and he, he flew it back to Sydney. And then when he retired, he didn't give it away either. He was a voluntary instructor for Schofield's Aero Club. He flew DC-3s for Rebel Air. And then he was a simulator instructor out at Bankstown for the, the new generation of Qantas cadets. Um, Resurfacing, I mentioned that he had perspex and metal in his face. It all started to come out of his face in about 1990, he get, got these moles. And they found uh, a lot of cancerous tissue and getting worse in his face. And they said to him, have you been, because they couldn't find a primary tumor, they said, have you been exposed to radiation? And he said, does filling your, your water bottle where the Enola Gay was aiming count? And uh, they, they sort of think he might've got a bit of a dose when he was up there in Hiroshima, but it ran through him very quickly. They cut some of the shrapnel out of his face and he was dead within, within six months of that first surgery. Around that time, this document that we've got here came to light and it's in the War Memorial about dad being awarded the Purple Heart, outstanding courage, superior airmanship, damaged aircraft to base whilst wounded. He never knew anything about it. And I followed it up over a number of years. He, he was mentioned in dispatches and had the US Air Medal, but it pretty much seemed to be a dead end. No one wanted to really know about it. It was a too hard basket. Um, 
till uh well that's one thing actually there's some of the aircraft that are still in museums that he flew i forgot that slide was there but the former cdf uh air chief marshal binskin read the book about dad and he'd been ceo of 77 squadron and he said just a second i'll chase this up and to his credit over about a two-year period he got into the u.s military files and found the full story that dad had been awarded the medal but it had been blocked by the assistant to the secretary for commonwealth relations uh in london and um there were telegrams saying do you do you suggest that we take everything the americans give us and th this will set a precedent etc 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 so it, it got buried and the upshot was that he would have been allowed to wear it if it had got passed through then but the conditions for the Purple Heart have subsequently meant it can only go to US citizens. So the United States said, look, we'd like to award him a US Air Medal posthumously. And it was actually his second US Air Medal. So on the 4th of July, two years ago, all those years after that um, event in Korea, he was awarded a second US Air Medal with citation. Uh, and it was presented by uh, Air Chief Marshal Binskin. And it brought a, a rather mysterious chapter to a close. Uh, he probably would have been embarrassed by all the fuss, to be perfectly honest, because um, all his medals until pretty close to his death just lived in a drawer unpinned. He always wore his active service medal on Anzac Day. He always went to the dawn service, but he, he never wore his medals and he never marched. He just used to go and watch and mum would march. Um, so that closed that chapter. And at what we've got up here is the Meteor 368 at the War Memorial. And that is the actual Meteor that Dad did his first combat sortie in Korea in was 368. And that's my kids there and they call it Granddad's Jet. So the day after the uh, second Air Medal was awarded, we uh, took them there into the Korean Memorial so they could see Granddad's Jet. And they took uh, the citation and my son Hayden there is in his Air League uniform. And they're my three daughters as well. So it sort of drew the story to a close. So I guess underlying it, yes, it's a story of a, a life of flying, but to me in many ways, it was a kid who didn't have much opportunity, but all he wanted to do was fly. And when he was terminally ill, he said to me, um, well, he actually said, we had some people come around feigning they were from the Department of Defense and they turned out to be lawyers. And I was in the next room and they said, oh, we're trying to get a, a group class action against all the, the government for all the people who served in Hiroshima. And he sat down and, and I heard him say, when I was a kid, I couldn't have dreamt that I'd fly aeroplanes, own a house and raise a family. He said, all of that's because of my military service. He said, now you want me to sue them. And they said, it's not as simple as that. He said, yes, it is, get out of my house. And to me, that sort of typifies more of the story. He was knocked back multiple times to the pilot's course. He never thought he'd be a pilot, but he ended up having a life of flight. And it was, he always felt privileged to be a pilot. And so I think that's the real story within the book. So that's pretty much it without precedent. Many thanks, Alan. Very interesting talk. And you've obviously given quite a few talks in your your time, I can tell by the, the, the way you've delivered it. Oh. Um, thank you, very, very good. Great, lots of good photos. Um, any, you're happy to take questions? Absolutely. So we got any questions? You um, need to hold your space bar down to talk or unmute yourself if you uh, would like to ask um, Owen a, a question. Sorry, Alan, no questions, but I've got your book. Read all your uh, your uh, your fly how to fly things in Australian aviation, and I can see a lot of resemblance between yourself and that photograph. Put, yeah. put, put that cap on your head, and you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a photo sitting in a meteor, and I've um got a photo of him black and white, and I've put one on top of the other, and it's a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's no escaping the fact it wasn't the milkman. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, John Tribe, if I may speak, um, I'm from the uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, Aviation Historical Society as I'm here as a guest and uh, I thank you so much oh and my god you really <coughs> hit the nail on the head there it was just a, you, are you a pilot yourself yeah 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 well you obviously know what you're talking about <coughs> I was in the Air Force and I had a very <coughs> undistinguished career I never had the uh, pleasure of meeting your father, but I did fly with Vance Drummond on one or two occasions. <coughs> after it must have been after his Korean time, and and uh, I've got so many things uh, that I could talk about with you, but um, it's it's just obviously there's great preparation in what you've done, but to have done it the way you've done it, I think everybody here, God, I nearly didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> what a shame if I'd missed this talk. It was oh, thanks very so much. Good. I did have the, uh, uh, I, I flew Wiraways, and uh, I must say there's a Wiraway thing coming on in a week or so, and uh, I'm probably one of the few old farts left. <laughs> uh, and uh, the only other thing is that, and I, I won't bore all the assembled throng, but you, your father's. Uh, meteor is is in the Canberra Museum, is it? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And and would you believe, speaking as a ne never never did anything person, but I I flew in, as a trainee at at Point Cook in the A twenty one one o three was it? I think it was the the one and only uh, one and only um, we're away that flew down the uh, sorry shot down a zero up in northern australia oh, john archer's one yeah i think it was, was it 103 oh, anyway that you got me there fred oh yeah, no. i that think that's air, correct. that airplane is in is in the uh, museum also it's it been is it, it's been live, and i take great pride when i get there <laughs> getting my picture taken standing in front of that airplane which i flew we all the course <laughs> i was on was a post-war course it was a bit uh, a bit later, but it was, I think, one of the last courses to be uh, to use the Tiger Moths and Wiraways as trainees, as tra a training aircraft. And uh, we all used to say, I flew the airplane that shot down the MiG in Korea <laughs> or the, the, yeah. the Spitfire in Britain. And it was always everything except the, uh, the Zero in uh, Northern <laughs> Australia. But yeah. thank you very much, and Owen. Thank and, you, John. Uh, I'd love to think I could uh, be questioned next week. I don't know who's talking we're always, but I'll be <laughs> happy to do that. What What John's not telling you is that he went on to be an air traffic controller. And he was one of my training officers. It's Bob Livingston. Oh, there you go, Bob. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I, he'll tell you the true story about John Tribe now, which is rather... 1972, John. Gosh, where's Bob Livingston? What does he look like? I, I can only see the thing. Anyway, not to worry. Turn your camera on, Bob. <laughs> no, he, he's there. It's just that I'm only looking at two or three. How about that? The name is very familiar, Bob. And I hope I was, um, I hope I knew what I was talking about. Most of us <laughs> didn't, did we? <laughs> there he is. I'm a lot older than I was then. <laughs> 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 Any other questions for Owen? Um, more statement than question. I really enjoyed the presentation and uh, just how it linked to so many other important things, conditions in the services, life and times, and your mm. mother's wedding dress. The yeah. same as my own mother's, same era, <laughs> was yeah. made from parachute silk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he... Um, he actually met her the night before he shipped out for Korea and she was a corporal in the headquarters building at um, Richmond, which when I get five minutes out there, I'm going to duck into now I can do it legally. And um, they'd lost his paperwork for his needles. And so he walked in, picked up her phone, excuse me, corporal, started rousing down the line. She thought, what an angry little man. <laughs> and um, he's like, and, and she's got a drawer open. And so he started eating her lollies while he's on the phone. <laughs> and, and she's going, yeah, right. And then he hangs up and walks out, storms out. Then he opens the door again and goes, do you want to go to the movies tonight? 
And she goes, yeah, okay. And so they went to the cinema there at Richmond, which I'm sure a number of you know, and he took her romantically to 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, the story of the Doolittle Raiders. So uh, he, he, he was a big romantic. He wrote back to her from Korea too. He used to send her photos of Sabres telling her that the drop tanks were as, cost as much as a car. So uh, there was no shortage of love letters from him. <laughs> Owen, uh, it's Peter Dunn. I'd, I'd like to ask an off-topic question if I could. Um, Go ahead, Peter. Can you tell us a little bit about your last flight that you had? Ah, uh, the 747 going to the desert and drawing the kangaroo. <laughs> That's the one. That's the one. Yeah, it, um, it, it, it was many weeks in the making and, and somewhat clandestine. And it wasn't so much for media purposes, but um, things like the kangaroo and even the harbour flyover, we had environmental parameters. So we'd been in the simulator doing all of these for a few weeks. Um, and it wasn't until we were approaching the start point for the the kangaroo that we knew it was actually going to happen. Um, if we hadn't, if, and once we were committed, we were committed. If we used up fuel, we were gonna stop at Hawaii, but we weren't going to leave a headless roof. Uh, so it was a lot of planning and there were points I think everyone thought what have we started here. There were 75 waypoints in drawing the kangaroo. Um, and even simple things, the radius of turn of the jumbo down low, uh, all the farewell flights we did, those the Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane ones, were at relatively light weight. Um, this was at near maximum weight. I think max, I think we're about 386 ton and max weight takeoffs 412.7. So we're fairly heavy. So you've got a fair radius of turn. So you had to hit your mark going outbound to get the turn back to come over the Harbour Bridge because no one wants you coming back over Palm Beach or something. <laughs> um, but it, be a bit embarrassing. So even down to that level of planning, and it, I think I've said to Fredo, um, we were continually getting asked by media in America as well, you must be emotional. This And all we wanted, we just didn't want to mess up. That was our overriding emotion. There were so many points at which we could have messed it up. So there was a lot of planning. Um, we had to give risk mitigation strategies to, to CASA. The Air Force were excellent with airspace up around Willy Town to draw it because we wanted to do it close enough to the coast, um, but we also didn't want to drop out of, because otherwise we'd drop out of ADSB range and those flight tracker apps wouldn't keep drawing it. So we had to find the right airspace. And the one that everyone, I think you might have sent me an email, Peter, the one everyone asked us was how, what sort of bank angle did we have going around yep. the top of the tail and the, the pause. And what we actually did, we stayed below 20,000 feet, which is the maximum altitude with flap. And we had 20 degrees of flap out. So we we're flying very slow. And we were able to fly turns. We never exceeded 25 degrees angle of bank. Um, and we had a, a definite speed margin, which relates back to if we had in excess of 45 knots of breeze, greater than light turbulence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we weren't going to do it because we were operating in a fairly small uh, speed band. So we were all sort of watching the speed very carefully as we ca uh, carried out those manoeuvres. But um, being stood down from Qantas now, if I don't get back on the pony in the, the next few years, uh, it's not a bad flight to have as your last one. And Mojave was an amazing place too. So um, I I'll take questions about that if anyone's got any too. <laughs> Uh, well, I, Bob Livingston again, I've got one question. Do you know my cousin by any chance, Cameron Livingston? Oh, yes, I'll fly with Cam. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. Uh, there you go. Was his son, um, I think his son was the bike rider, wasn't he? Uh, no, Cameron's, well, I was going to say young, but he's not that young anymore, yeah. of course. But he, right. he did the last uh, uh, Tokyo flight in yeah, Singapore. Yeah, that's right. He did the big yeah. loop over the city and... Did yeah, a touchdown where the wingtips yeah. the wingtips barely twitched. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's um no, no, I didn't know you two were related because I remember you out at Bankstown when I was a young flying instructor too, Bob. Oh you would, you would, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a rep. <laughs> oh and uh, Rex Ramsey. 
I met your father in the 50s at Williamtown before I went from there to Korea and um, we came back in 55 so it was very very interesting hearing your story. Oh thank you. Yeah I've struck a few people who did know him over the years through these talks in fact I gave this talk at the National Press Club when the book first came out. You'll, you'll notice it's now got the Air Force badge on it. Fredo's uh, somewhat behind that because after uh, Air Chief Marshal Binskin got onto the story, I, I rewrote the last chapters and and uh, Fredo was kind enough to, to see that it, it had relevance to the Air Force. And um, I was giving the talk at the National Press Club and an elderly gentleman came up and he was actually one of Dad's instructors at Point Cook. And I thought, wow, it's about the only one of Dad's instructors I've ever met, I think. But uh, he only flew with him on a couple of hops, but it, it, I had the logbook with me and his name was in there. So, yeah, it's been an amazing journey for me to meet so many of the veterans and the people that knew him. And it filled in a lot of gaps because he was a, a fairly quiet bloke. Hello. Hey, um, I want Fredo here. Um, yeah. I just want to say thanks very much for the the great presentation and thanks for the plug then. Um, I think just for everyone's sake, it's a great book and Air Force is really proud to be able to put our badge on it and to have Air Chief Marshal Binskin's forward in there. So um, well done, hats off mate. And um, it's good to have you on the team for our stuff for 2021, which will, be, us, will keep us a surprise for everyone in the audience. Hello, uh, Charles Case from Perth here. Yes. Yeah, good to see you again uh, in almost real life. Yes, uh, Charles. Yeah, um, it's just a connection between uh, your father and uh, two of our WA air cadets uh, that got killed in uh, Korea. Uh, and you, you know all this, obviously, but uh, one was uh, Max Colbrook. And uh, yes. he was with your father in the morning and they, they attacked a, a supply tunnel and then two hours later, Max took off uh, with uh, Middlebrook, I think it was, Middleton, Peter Middleton. Pete Middleton, yep. They were after a, a gun that uh, Max had spotted. Yes. So uh, Middleton went in and um, uh, shot it up and then uh, um, Max followed him in. Um, and the next thing, um, Middleton saw this uh, meteor flying towards him with his petrol tank on fire. And, uh, and Max said, oh, I'll take it straight back to base, but uh, that's the last they saw of him. And I think your dad was one of the ones that went searching for him afterwards. Yeah, I, I remember that quite vividly because dad also said, you got nailed when you went back on the second pass or if you went to hit something that you'd been after that morning. And he said that Max went number two on something that we were doing number two. He said it was a bit odd. And the interesting one is, and I've, I've actually published this in the book. Uh, it would probably be too hard to pull the photo up, but one letter Dad did write back to Mum. He mentions Colbrick got shot down that day. Um, and he said, because uh, Mum was a WAF, and one of her jobs was going through the paperwork of who'd been killed. So she said she was a nervous wreck when Dad was up there because um, Mum's first fiancé had been killed in air crew in World War II. And... Um, he said that in this letter, and it gave an insight, I think, into my father. He said, you probably know by now that Max Colbrook got clobbered today. He said uh, he was hitting a target Smithy and I had hit that morning or something. Um, he said, the blokes in the tent next to me are pretty upset, but they'll get used to it. And I think that's an insight into his time in New Guinea as a commando. Um, because he was all, I won't say an old man, but he was 25, 26 and had served actively on the ground in New Guinea. And just the tone he said to mum, they'll get used to it. I think that reflects a bit. Because um, I said to him once, how did you find Korea after New Guinea? He said, oh, it was great. We got fed in Korea. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it, it gave a bit of an insight. But yeah, he knew Max Colbrook quite well from what I understand. Yeah. The other interesting point is that uh, meteor in the AWM, 368, is it? Yes. That was the meteor flown by Max Colbrook when he damaged the MiG-15. Yes. And he got the DFM for that, and I think the um, US Air Medal and also the United Masons Medal. <laughs> 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 um, 
and they've got a plaque up on the wall with a, with a story. Right back. beside it, they have. Yeah. And the other um, air cadet from WA that uh, was killed in 77 Squadron was J.B. Halley, John Halley. John Halley, yeah. Believe it or not, he was shot down and killed on his 77th operation with 77 Squadron. Yeah, the, right. Dad said he, either it was, from what Dad recalled, he either was a victim of the the mushing of the meteor, or he said the other rumour was that he got a bit of target fascination because I think he was the one Dad said someone saw him and he just clipped the ridge. They reckon another 20 or 30 foot and they reckon he would have got over it. Yeah, just bad luck, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, enjoy your talk. Okay, That's thanks, fine. Chaz. I suppose to follow up on Chaz's and the discussion then about the um, the MIAs in Korea, one of the things that our branch in Air Force History and Heritage has been doing is we've been doing the research of the 18 missing uh, missing in action or unrecovered war casualties, as I think we've got to call them these days. Um, we've been doing a lot of detailed analysis as to where they may have gone down, et cetera. Because if we, with the on again, off again, Trump, um, uh, North Korean discussions, which have gone very quiet at the moment. But um, if that ever opens up, and we do get the opportunity to go in there. We want to go in there and, and find the remains. So um, we never leave our people behind either. Very good. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, thanks again, Alan, for a very excellent talk and thanks for volunteering to give the talk. Um, yeah, no worries at all, no worries at yeah. all. It's been my pleasure. And uh, if anyone thinks of anything they want to ask me later, um, I'm sure you can get in touch with me via Peter, via email or whatever, but uh, yep. no, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Alan, if you could um, stop that share. Um, yep. And um, thanks again. If anyone wants to stick around, I'll just give a bit of a demo of this um, database thing I'm sharing. But before we do that, can we all give Owen a, uh, a round of applause? Well, thanks very presentation. much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I Thank better go pick my son up from Air League now. He finishes very shortly. So oh, okay. it's been fantastic. And um, Did they log in, do you know? Sorry? Did they log in? Oh, I'm, I'm unaware. I'll, I'll sure I'll hear about it when I get out there. <laughs> oh, let, us, let me know. <laughs> Will do, Peter. Thanks right very on. much. Thanks a lot. Um, Thank you. So, Hi. so for Hi. those who want to Thank stick you. around, yeah. I'm happy to just give a little bit of a demo of something that I've been working on that uh, might be of interest. So uh, I'll just share a screen here. I found I found this software called Notion. Um, which you can get um, on all your devices um, in both Apple and Windows. And it sort of replaces all sorts of things, note takers, uh, task managers, databases, uh, you name it. And I've only been playing with it for probably four days, four or five days. And what I've done is um I can't find the cursor it's beside my books can uh what i might do is just mute everyone uh, Sign your books wait till i just find that where the hell am i uh so no idea what you mean what am i doing here we go so mute all mute all right so now I'm just going to find the screen again. There it is. So what I've done uh, is just produce a couple of databases. I've, I've got a huge book collection and I always have trouble finding books. Um, so what I've done is start a database in this um, program called Notion for my book collection. And I've given my cupboards a nut, nut, uh, an alpha, numeric alpha, and then the, each shelf in the cupboard a, a number. So now I've got a full database of all my books um, that I hold. There's all 712 books. So I've got quite a few. Um, and you can do searches. You can do a search, you know, if I want any books on Townsville, uh, there they all are. There's nine of them where Townsville is mentioned in the, uh, the title of the book. So that's one database I've, I've uh, set up. 
I'm currently working on another one, um, which will be eventually a very large database. Um, that this is, uh, it's more or less replicating what I've got on my website. So I've got a website called Australia is at War, which many of you would probably know. And one of the main web areas on there is one on aircraft crashes in Australia during World War II. So far, I've documented well over 2,000. And if I ever get the time, um, I reckon I'll get to at least 5,000 in due course. So a couple of days ago, I started to um, try and work out how I'd lay this database out and, um, and what um, the columns would be and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I've started to enter the data uh, and you can see what I've entered. It's, it's really easy to enter. Um, and I'll give you a demo uh, of how you do that shortly. But as you can see, I've only got 460 in so far. It's been a pretty busy few days though to do that. And as I said, I'll, what, I've, what I've entered so far is all of um, the ones I've got for the ACT, all of South Australia, all of Tasmania, all of Western Australia, and all the ones in the general Townsville area. So um, I've started on the smaller ones first and working my way up. Um, so the rest of Queensland and Victoria and Northern Territory will, will be quite large. And but you can do all, sorts, all sorts of searches. Um, you have to watch your spelling a little bit better or you're not gonna find things in your search. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did you spot a few? Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll sort them out eventually. Um, as I said, I was been doing it in a bit of a hurry. You can add filters and do searches. So, I what what? Let's. I'll just try something here. I'll try a search for um, crashes for Abro Ansons. So there's all the crashes that I've got for Abro Ansons uh, in the database so far. Thirty one of them. Okay. And that's so one of your worst mistakes because you've got to have Ron. Oh yeah, I have too. I have. Oh, that, that's easy to fix. So when I fix that, it'll, it'll, I'll see if I can work out how to do it now. Uh, where are we? No, I might have to do it later. Avro. Here we go. Avro. Thanks for pointing that out. I would have eventually seen it. Uh, right. So. Fixed should be fixed now. So if I do a filter search because it's changed the name now, it, it can't find that one because it's spelt differently. So aircraft type, and if I select Abro Anson, so there's all the Abro Ansons um, that I've got, uh, as I said, 31. So if I add a second filter, um, add another filter, um, and let's say we wanna search for um, the state, and I'll try which one? Tasmania. Uh, did I try Tasmania or did I try? I must have tried South Australia. Sorry, South Australia. So there's all the ones in South Australia. So twenty of those thirty-one. That that gives you a bit of an idea of sort of the power of what you can do uh, with this. I'll just remove those two filters. So um, it's pretty clever and in Duke, I'll just get to the bottom of it, just to show you how you, um, and it syncs across all your devices. Right. So if you want to add a new um, entry, um, I've got to remember how to do it now. It's been a few days since I've done it. So you just click in the box, and then you select the aircraft type liberator. So I don't have to type it out. Click in the next box and put in the date. It's the 19th. Put in the next date. It's the 19th of September, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a US Air Force uh, and it's in Victoria. And, you know, I've left this out at the moment. But that's, that's how you do it, how you add the data. And so I've been just transferring that from my website uh, across to this database, which as I said, will get to eventually close to two and a half thousand. 
I've um, started up um, a, a little one for the AHSA. I've got the membership list here. I won't click on that because it's got a lot of confidential information for our members. But I've got one here on Zoom meetings. So I've, this is how I keep track of the Zoom meetings. So the one tonight, you can see I've got a to-do type thing. And I've got one for flyer requested, flyer designed, flyer issued with the newsletter which uh, for the, our next meeting will be tomorrow. Um, so if we look at this one here for David, uh, I've already designed uh, the flyer. So those two boxes are ticked and I've got a reminder set up here. You just put at and put when you want to, to get a reminder from the software and it'll pop up tomorrow and say, you need to issue the flyer for David Lindley's talk um, uh, tomorrow, which I'll do and then I'll just tick it off to say it's completed. So I've got those laid out with all reminders um, for our meetings. Um, what else have I got here? I've got one on the, um, I'm researching, well, I'm doing a talk next week on the 435th Bomb Squadron, but um, I'll skip that one, uh, go to this one. I've been looking at um, uh, all the research material that I've got on the different aircraft that arrived with the uh, 435th Bomb Squadron. And I've just put it in here so, uh, to keep track of it all because I, I tend to lose things uh, in emails and whatever. So now using this software, I can start to aggregate uh, my research into one spot and find it very easily. You can also put embed photos into this. Um, you can see here I've actually embedded my web page on um, that particular aircraft, which was used to rescue General MacArthur or evacuate, should I say, MacArthur from the Philippines. So you can embed um, websites, you can embed movies, uh, pictures, as I said. You can embed a link to a web page. If I clicked on that, that will open the ADF serials web page uh, on this aircraft. I won't click because it'll open on a separate page and you won't be able to see it because you're only viewing this page in uh, Zoom. So, um, yes, I've got all sorts of things I'm researching. So I'm researching MI6 and these are some of the uh, spies that were in Australia during World War II. Uh, this guy was um, the MI6 agent working in Brisbane in MacArthur's headquarters. So, it's a very, very good bit of software and I highly recommend it for people who like to do research and be able to find things again. Um, um, so any questions? Yeah, what if you, nobody else, like you can't send that to them, can you? You'd have I, to. You'd what I can do, I can. Based. I'm still very new at this, but you can export this page as a PDF. Oh, um, okay, as a PDF. Or a HTML or a, or a CSV, if it, that yeah. database that I showed you. Um, I can also um, share, now how do I do that? I've only been using this. I was for thinking that you might have, you know, you'd need the software yourself to read what it is, but that's good if you can go and PDF. Um, and see the share button here. You can also share to the web. So I could share, the, so at the moment it's it's private, but I could share this to the web and then all, all I do then is copy this link here and send that to whoever uh, wants to have a look at it. So if I do that now and go to, where are we? Uh, hang on, I've got so many things open here. Um, why don't I just get a few things out of the way? Um, where the hell's the chat? <laughs> uh, I got so much open on the screen here. I can't see where the chat down feature the is. Of the yeah, I know it's down the bottom of the screen, but I'm trying to find the bottom of the screen. Uh, uh, doesn't matter. I'll um, I'll I'll email it out to people. So yeah, so you can share um, the each page or the whole whole area. Um, uh, of, of one of these blocks over here to to the web. Um, I'll just turn that off. 
Um, Peter, would you be able to post the link to that that um, software? Because I couldn't understand what you were saying it was called. N-O-T-I-O-N, Notion. Oh, Notion. Okay. Notion, N-O-T-I-O-N, Notion. Um, the, the way I learned about it was um, I spotted it on Facebook and like anything that I want to find out about, I go to YouTube and um, there are literally thousands of YouTube videos on how to use Notion. You wouldn't believe some of the complex uh, setups that some people have got with their to-do lists and, uh, and on all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I've got it. You can see down the bottom left here. I've got, when I go away, I've got a, a checklist of things I've got to pack. So oh, I, um, so I just go through that. <laughs> so I can, I've moved that from another bit of software, which I don't use anymore now. Uh, so there's all there's, this replaces about three other bits of software that I use. Um, when I give a talk, one of my guest speaking talks, I've got a checklist. So I've got that. Um, you know, when I, I'm trying, trying to keep track of all my um, contacts that I've got um, uh, for my research around the place, um, I can use that to easily find stuff. Um, um, so there's a, you know, this, this over here will get a lot bigger in due course. It's totally free. They've about six months, uh, probably since the COVID started, they changed um, a, a paid service. Um, you could only have uh, a thousand blocks. See how that light, that highlight there, it's got a plus sign and six yeah. dots. That's called a block. Uh, four months or so ago, you could only have with a free account, you could only have a thousand blocks. Now you can have unlimited blocks, and there is the only limitation is a file size. So you know how I was uploading, uh, embedding photos and and uh, videos and things like that. There is a five megabyte, which is fairly fairly uh, luxurious. That's a fairly big file, five megabyte file limit. If you want to exceed that and you do get other extra features, you pay only $4 a month, which is peanuts, really. It's 48 bucks a year um, to be able to use the software. So there's lots of, I'm only showing you the very basic stuff here. Yeah. Uh, it's just, and you can move things around. Um, um, I don't want to do too much moving because I, uh, I'll probably, um, stuff things up but um if i wanted to move that that there into ahsa you just drag it across to there and it'll mm -hmm. i'll give it a go it'll um it'll get, see there it is there now yeah okay so i've moved it i've decided if i want to put um this at the top i just move it up there um if i want to um start another column and do it in two columns i can do do that Okay, mm -hmm. um, so it, it's got a lot of flexibility. It's got a lot of functionality. It's got a lot of promise. It can be a little bit confusing when you start, um, but um, once you sort of figure it out, um, it's um, it's quite powerful. Yeah, you know, I'm still a little bit bamboozled, but as you can see, I've made a bit of progress. But um, anyway, I just recommend it to. Uh, I know. Some of the people here are, are researchers, um, and this um, is a, a great way of um, keeping uh, a good set of research notes. Do you, uh, excuse me, Peter, do you save that to external hard drive or you? Uh, all the in cloud? the cloud. It's all, all in the cloud. The cloud. All in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And then it syncs, as I said, so if I picked up my iPad, um, it'll be on, you know, whatever change I'd made on, on my desktop. Yeah, will now be on my iPad. If I'm out with the phone and Warwick rings me up and says, "Is Joe Blow a member?" I can look it up on the phone and you know go to that spreadsheet um, that I didn't open because of the privacy issues. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I've I've got it all there in my hand. Excellent. So 
eventually I'd like to be able to make that aircraft uh, aircraft crashes database public um, and searchable. But at the moment, I've tried, I've experimented um, opening it up on a you know on the web. But when you go to it, you can't do those um, uh, those what do they call those search types? I forgot what filter searches. You can do an ordinary search, just a word search, but you can't do the filter searches like I was doing, you know, for the aircraft type and the month and whatever, um, which is a bit of a bummer. But um, I've sent them a suggestion uh, for that as a um, an update in due course. But if if you're interested, I suggest you. Um, you go to YouTube, and um, I will. I, 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 do, I got an email from them this morning with three very good videos, which I'll pass that through to our Google group, and um, maybe David Knight and um, and Tom or whoever might like to pass that on to the um, Tasman. Uh, sorry, to the Victorians and the New South Wales people as well. Anyway, yeah, that's thanks, Peter. It sounds like uh, something I might be interested in. Yeah, yeah, I thought, Bob, um, I like the um, the uh, membership list for AHSA, which I didn't open. I actually, it's it's in a spreadsheet on my computer, but all I did was import it into Notion and it converted it into a database format. Okay, so you can import, um, you can import things. Um, uh, for it, like if you use, oh gee, it was, I can't remember the name of the, there's other software that um, that um, does similar things, and I've forgotten the name of the software now. I did used to use it once, but you can import stuff from some of the other similar software into this Notion as well. It's pretty pretty good stuff. <laughs> it looks like yeah, it. I'll look into it. Thanks, Peter. I might yeah. just slide off now. See.